Welcome to the Zig for the Uninitiated. My name is Tyler, and we're going to start talking about strings today. So, Zig strings is a topic that I've been asked to um, make a video about. A lot of people get confused with the way Zig deals with strings. There are several different types, and those types can be kind of opaque. Um, they don't make a lot of sense at first. But I think as you get to understand the way Zig uh, handles strings and the way strings are represented, computers it starts to make sense and you'll just be able to breeze through it it won't be a big confusion so that's my kind of promise to use my hope is that after getting through this video you'll have a lot less anxiety about dealing with strings and a lot more confidence and understanding why they are the way that Zig does it because it's different than other languages and I think a good way to, to realize see how it's different is to look at the history of how strings have been um, interpreted in computing um, to see why we are where we are in other languages, and then also understand maybe some of Zig's choices, and also just understand what a Zig string is, or what how Zig treats strings. So if we go back to I don't know 1970s or 60s, I don't know when ASCII came out. Um, I could look it up, but I'm not going to because I don't care. Uh, you get the ASCII character encoding, and this wasn't the first, and it wasn't the only character encoding, but it was perhaps the most popular, I would say, encoding, because it had a lot of nice benefits, and like it was really well thought out encoding. Um, and it encoded the Latin alphabet plus characters and control codes all in seven bits. So it used 128 different characters, um, and it was able to encode that all in that way. So you got, with seven bits meant you can encode any string, any character information in one byte. And that was, that's, that was really convenient. And it led to the rise of things like the char array or the char pointer um, in C, where you get what, how C handles strings, which is you got just a pointer to the first character in the string and then a guarantee by the programmer that eventually there would be a null uh, value and that would terminate the string. And so that's what are called null terminated strings. I think those are quite well known throughout programming. But if you haven't heard of them, that's what they are. Just a pointer to a character with a guarantee by the programmer there will be a null uh, value somewhere. Now, we also know that that has never, ever caused problems or um, exploits and security issues. Never. You also had people who, like those who wrote Pascal, who didn't want to deal with uh, null terminated problems. That also had some issues with if you want to operate on the whole string. Like, for example, if you want to know the length of a C string, you have to just loop over the C string until you get to that null terminated value and just count up. There's no other way. They didn't, they didn't like that. And so they came up with length prefix strings. And length prefix strings um, just had a length at the very first byte, told you how long the string was, and then you would have the string for that many bytes. And that was, that was very convenient. You automatically are, always knew how long your string was going to be. You automatically had some guarantees that you could put into the code, not just trust the programmer that he was going to put that final zero byte. No, you knew the length and the, the string. Now, the, the drawback was that you had the overhead. C, the C string was just straight. You got the data, and that was it. Pascal string you had the overhead of the length. You had to use a whole byte to encode the rest of the string. And if you wanted more than 256 characters, then you needed two bytes, or three bytes, or four bytes, and so on. And that is that was the drawback. You had some extra overhead with your strings. Now, that did lead to what we usually see in a lot of modern languages today, like Rust and Zig, which are fat pointers, where you'd have a length plus a pointer to a string, and those would be twice the size of a regular pointer. So instead of 18, eight bytes, sorry, it would be 16 bytes, but that would allow you to encode tons of data, more data than your computer can actually hold in memory. That's That was kind of that. There were some other ones, seven-bit strings. I'm not gonna get into them, 
Um, they were pretty clever in coding, but they fell out of use mostly because you can't, you can only support ASCII in it or some other encoding that encodes your characters in seven bits because it requires the use of the eighth bit to tell you when to stop the string. And that leads us into the next point, which is eventually computers started being used by people outside of the English speaking world, more than just Americans who wanted to use the computer to encode their languages, French, Norwegian, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and or Arabic. All these languages have lots of different character sets that they wanted to be able to put into their systems. The problem was not only could you not encode the values uh, of those characters or those alphabets into just one byte, some of them maybe you could, but things like Chinese are just never going to fit in one byte. Um, you wouldn't be able to, even if you had your own encoding for each of those different languages, you wouldn't be able to exchange data between those um, systems without changing the encoding all the time. And you wouldn't be able to display them in the same set of data. So if you had a document, you'd have to pick the encoding for that document, or at least pick points where you change between encodings. And that would be just incredibly complex. And so what do computers do, or what do programmers do, I mean, when they have a complex problem? They make it even more complex. And so they invented Unicode. Um, eventually Unicode came about, and it was, you know, the, the solution to this problem of how do you represent all these different character sets in one unified encoding, hence Unicode. Um, now Unicode allows you to do that and it also has separate different kinds of encodings for it. So you have UTF-8, UTF-16, UTF-32. And that's important to understand is that Unicode is a standard. You have UTF-8, UTF-16, UTF-32, which are all just different ways to encode Unicode. Important to understand that. So how do modern languages then deal with this, right? Because C, Pascal, those are older languages, and I don't know the status. I mean, I'm pretty sure C has done nothing to do uh, Unicode support. Um, perhaps it's added some standard library functions for it. But Pascal, I, I don't know. I don't follow Pascal. But you get more modern languages like Python, Go, Rust, and Zig, and you wonder, well, how do they deal with this fact that now we have this explosion of, of data that are is way more complex than what you could just encode in ASCII? And it adds a lot of complexity to dealing with strings. And so in languages like Python, um, you get a string type. So this is specifically Python 3, um, it was one of the big breaking changes, is that the string type then became guaranteed to be encoded in UTF-8 by default. Now, what you could do is you could change that encoding, but you'd have to go back to the underlying bytes. Um, so you start seeing this thing. There's this underlying bytes versus the encoding type. So strings become what is the encoded type always having some underlying bytes that represent that type, which is what it's always been. It's just that in, when you're only dealing with ASCII, those two are the same. The encoding and the bytes are essentially the same, other than that there are some bytes that are invalid. Go, very similarly, allows you to have Unicode. I don't know the encoding that Go chose. I think it's, I, I would assume UTF-8. Um, but its string type is that. And I don't know if it allows you to change um, between it, but very similar to Python. Rust um, also has Unicode enforced, and not just Unicode enforced. If I remember correctly, it is guaranteed to be, to be valid UTF-8. So when you deal with a string, if you give a value at compile time to Rust program that is not valid UTF-8, it will be a compile error if you try to make it as a, a string type. It will need to be uh, an array of bytes. And so you start seeing this, this dichotomy, or I don't know, this pattern, like I just said. Underlying bytes versus a string type, which allows you to operate those, those bytes as strings. So what do we do is we get to zig. 
What does Zig do for a string type? Well, the answer is Zig doesn't have a string type, not uh, selected by the language. And the language designers have purposely chosen not to support a uh, default string type. Rather, what has they've done is focused on just dealing with those underlying bytes. And the reason for this is that there are many opinionated choices that have to be made with um, when you decide to, to how to handle strings, especially when you're deciding how to handle Unicode strings. You have to decide the default uh, uh, encoding. So if you're gonna do UTF-8, 16, or 32, you have to decide how you're gonna iterate over the string by default. If you iterate over by bytes, or if you iterate by code points, or if you iterate by graphemes. And I don't have a lot of time to get into Unicode, but those are three different ways to think about the data that you have in Unicode. You can think of a grapheme as a what you visually see. You can think of a code point as the different Unicode code points. And obviously we know what a byte is. Um, those are all three different ones, and they're all valid in different situations. So then you either you have to choose one of those as the default, so making an opinion about that. So there's a lot of opinionated choices that you have to make. And so rather than having those opinions foisted on the users of the Zig language, the, de the designers have decided that it would be best if the uh, community comes up with its own string libraries that then every individual program can take advantage of uh, for what they want. If you want a program that deals with Unicode in one way, you can do it that way. And if you want a program that deals with Unicode in a different way, you can do that way, right? So if you want to iterate over graph themes versus iterating over bytes, two different ways, and, and you can do that. Now, not everyone agrees with that decision, and it is a bit of I don't think it's very controversial, but there's, you know, discussion that goes around it. However, and this is the point, there are also performance issues when it comes to dealing with Unicode. And so by elevating one value to be the string type, you're also kind of pushing someone, especially the way Zig is designed, you're pushing them to use that type. And so then you also want to make sure that type works well and whatnot. And so rather than having the language make that choice and, and kind of nudge people one direction. Um, they want it to be done something where different libraries can have it, where there isn't the that opinion. So that's that. Now, where does the confusion come in? Because obviously Zig has to deal with strings. And one of the most common places that you deal with strings is in string literals. And so I'm going to talk about this because I do want to talk about the string types that you'll run into. So a lot of times in Zig, you're going to run into different string types. And I put this here. This is for another video eventually about Zig pointers. I made a video about pointers in Zig, but I made that in a much more higher level idea of just talking about how pointers work. Um, there are, there's more in-depth information to go into. And so I'll make another video about Zig pointers. But just keep in mind that in Zig, you can have pointers to many items. And you can have pointers to just a single item. And they're represented a little differently in the type system. And that shows up when it comes to Zig strings. The next, uh, the, the big thing when it comes to Zig strings that I want to talk about is the different kinds of types that you'll see associated with strings. Because Zig, like I said, doesn't have a string type, but it does have types that are used when you deal with string data, what you consider string data, but it doesn't have a specific type. So the most common type that you'll see is going to be the slice or array of bytes. And really the most common is gonna be the slice of bytes. And this is because generally it is going to be the most broad um, value you can use where it can take in other types and kind of coerce them automatically and safely into that value, right? So a string literal can then just be treated as a slice of bytes. So that's the most common type that you'll run into. If you are looking through Z, uh, Zig code, 
you see a ray of U8, there's a good chance that you're also dealing with strength. It depends on the context of the function. Now, string literals. I think this is where the most confusion comes in because string literals in Zig are uh, typed in a specific way. The type that you get is an array of a null terminated constant U8s. So let's break that down. When you type in a string literal into a Zig project or Zig program, the compiler will take that Zig literal and put it into the static read-only section of the program. Now, if you don't know what that means, we'll watch my video about processes and the different ways that the different memory uh, sections that you have. But just as a quick reminder, every process has different memory segments. And one of those segments is going to be a spot for read-only static data. This is data that will exist for the entirety of the program, and it's immutable. And that's what you get when you get a string literal. Zig also post pins a zero or a null byte after that string. And that's done so that you can easily be able to take that string and use it for between APIs that require a null terminator and ones that don't. Because if you didn't have that null terminator, then you'd have to copy the data out and add a null terminator there. So just for convenience sake, it's always added in when you have a string literal. The third type that you'll run into is going to be the null terminated array or slice of bytes, which is basically what we just talked about with um, string literals. It's an array or a slice that is guaranteed to have a zero at the end. Now, like in C, Sometimes if you're, if you're making those yourself, not just using string literals, then it's up to you to verify as the programmer that there's going to be a null character. The computer, the compiler does not check that there's a null character there. So that's why these ones are usually only used when you're dealing with C interoperability. So when you're calling a C function that requires a null terminated slice or a null terminated array, then you'll need to do that. I need to just cut that out. Okay, finally, and this is one just to be aware of, there are things called C pointer strings. Um, you will see this if you use Zig's ability to translate C code into Zig. It will sometimes automatically generate a type that looks like this, this bracket star C bracket. That is a C pointer string. And if you read the documentation, in fact, if I find it down here and see C pointers, right? It says this, this type is to be voided whenever possible. The only valid reason for C using a C pointer is an auto-generated code from what translating C code. So there you go. That's the official documentation saying you shouldn't use this type directly. You should only ever use it if it's been generated for you. But it's good to know because sometimes it'll come up in an error trace, especially if you're interoper interoperating with the C library. So those are the, the basic Zig strings. Um, that's it for today's video. I hope that answers your questions um, about Zig strings. If you have any more questions, please leave them down below. I'm also going to link this discussion here from Zigit. Um, if you don't, if you, you know, if you have more questions and depth questions, you can leave them down below, but also go to Zigit and just ask them there. Got great people there who will answer your questions. This one is a great discussion about um, Zig, uh, Zig strings and Unicode and how they're represented. And yeah. Happy coding. See you next time.